Okay. Uh, okay, and uh, just a, a small note to all the authors. We will be recording this session and putting it on YouTube. So if you have any objections, then you can let me know by chat or you can send a mail to the organizers. Uh, otherwise, we'll be putting it on YouTube. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm chairing uh, the session on quantitative models and meta models uh, analysis and validation. And uh, we have three papers. Uh, and the first presentation uh, is the paper entitled uh, uh, Compositional Safe Approximation of a Response Time Distribution of Complex Workflows. It is a paper by Laura Carnevale, Marco Paolieri, Riccardo Reali, and uh, Enrico Vicario. And uh, I think that the speaker is uh, Riccardo Reali. So you can go with uh, the registration. Hello everyone, my, my name is Riccardo Reali. I am a PhD student from the University of Florence and um, I'm going to present the paper uh, Composition and Safe Approximation of Response Time of Complex Workflows, which I worked on with uh, Laura Carnevali and Enrico Vicario from the University of Florence and Marco Paolieri from the University of Southern California. The paper uh, proposes a formalism to model complex and not well nested uh, workflows, exploiting stochastic time pattern at blocks uh, to represent uh, workflow control patterns um, that are arranged uh, together, forming a, a structure tree. The structure tree representation enables a compositional technique for an efficient uh, top down evaluation of the workflow. But uh, it is also worth uh, to notice that the representation enables an easy extendability. And so the method can be integrated uh, with different evaluation strategies and analysis heuristics. The technique is developed uh, to guarantee a safe bound uh, approximation for the response time distribution of the workflow. And the experimentation has been uh, conducted uh, in order to assess uh, um, the feasibility and the scalability of the approach. And to this end, uh, we evaluated the compositional method with uh, eight different models having increasing complexity. And uh, we have used uh, three different heuristics to investigate uh, how results change in terms of uh, accuracy when uh, different actions are taken uh, during the analysis. The work uh, um, is a development of a previous paper, uh, which we have extended by treating no, not well nested workflows, um, by introducing a hierarchical representation through which uh, we calculated a safe bound for the response time. Workflow specification is enabled by combining uh, recursively STPN blocks, uh, and the composition of blocks can be encoded using a BNF grammar, which uh, enables the representation of both uh, simple activities and composite blocks. These composition rules break the well-formed nesting of the workflows, um, in particular for dark blocks uh, where there might be not well form nesting of end and XOR constructs. And this uh, increases the complexity of workflows we can handle, but also um, the expressivity. Every block uh, shares the semantic of stochastic time patronet. Um, both simple and composite blocks uh, have a single initial place and a single final place. And the final place, uh, is also guaranteed to be eventually reached uh, with uh, probability one. Um, activity blocks uh, embed uh, single transitions, and whenever such transitions are generally distributed, as in the cases that we have experimented, the complexity of the workflow increases um, ulteriorly. Um, finally, workflows can be represented as uh, structure trees. 
and the structured tree is the graphical formalism we provided uh, as the one uh, that is uh, exemplified in the figure on the on the right. Uh, the structured tree is derived uh, by the BNF grammar and provides a hierarchical representation of the workflow, um, which is functional in many aspects. One is that uh, it simplifies the analysis of uh, workflow complexity on multiple levels of depth. Uh, and the other aspect is that it um, enables different uh, heuristics through which uh, the composing and analyzing the workflow. Um, finally, it also makes the representation of a workflow unique and uh, robust um, against local changes. To evaluate uh, complexity of blocks, uh, we perform the uh, non-deterministic analysis. And this technique outputs a state class graph, uh, which is a graph obtained by enumeration of state classes. And state classes are couples um, consisting on the marking of a state uh, So I think there is some uh, technical uh, problem. Uh, I'm, see, I'm seeing that uh, they are trying to adjust the problem. Well, let's wait and, and see what happens. Now, Hello, everyone. My, my name is... Riccardo Reali. I am a PhD student from the University of Florence and um, I'm going to present the paper uh, Compositional Safe Approximation of Response Tower Flow Complexity. And uh, this way the state class graph encodes the set uh, of feasible behaviors of the system. The state class graph also enables the identification of regenerative states uh, that are those states where no randomly distributed transitions are enabled since non-deterministic time persists. Um, in the figure, there is a, an example of a state class graph where uh, arcs uh, represent uh, fireable transitions and notes uh, the reachable states uh, from some state in the predecessors. If a workflow increases in complexity, it may happen that uh, deterministic analysis is unfeasible. In these cases, we approximate the complexity of the workflow with a bottom-up method that uh, works on different level of depth. At the bottom level, the block uh, complexity is uh, encoded in a tuple whose values are evaluated on the state class graph. And in particular, we have uh, C, which is the maximum number of concurrently enabled generally distributed transitions. R is the maximum length of paths uh, of a regeneration epoch. And the EFT and LFT are respectively the earliest and latest firing time of the block. At the next higher levels, block complexity is encoded in two ways. One consists in the same complexity um, tuple computed at uh, lower levels but uh, here evaluated for um, a simplified block, which is obtained by uh, replacing internal blocks uh, with uh, activities uh, having the earliest uh, and latest firing times computed for the blocks at lower levels. Uh, in this case, the analysis of the simplified block uh, provides an estimation of the complexity of the block 
which only depends on its topology and not uh, on uh, inner blocks. The other way consists uh, in computing an upper bound, um, both for value C and R with a calculus. And in this case, uh, we use uh, capital letters to underline this difference. Um, finally, the complexity of a block, and in particular the complexity of the top block, uh, is determined by whether uh, the C and the R values of the tuple of the simplified block uh, and the uppercase C and the uppercase R values of the not simplified block uh, do not exceed some uh, arbitrary thresholds. Uh, analysis of blocks is performed through four actions, uh, which differ according to uh, the type of the block and, and the complexity of the block. And action one is applied only to well-structured uh, blocks that does not contain repeat or dark blocks, such as uh, sequence and uh, or XOR blocks that are evaluated uh, numerically. Action two is uh, applied to blocks uh, having affordable complexity and that also have distributions expressed uh, in analytical form. In this case, uh, the completion time is evaluated by uh, regenerative transient analysis, which provides uh, results in numerical form. Regenerative, regenerative transient analysis is a, a technique to evaluate Markov regenerative processes um, which uh, is a class of processes for which uh, um, a regenerative state uh, uh, will eventually reach uh, with uh, probability one. And for this class of processes, uh, the probability of reaching a certain state uh, j from the initial state i at the time t can be computed as the solution of a system of integral equations of Volterra that can be solved numerically, assuming that we are able to compute the global kernel G and the local kernel R. Kernels are efficiently evaluated through the method of stochastic state classes, where stochastic state class, one of those uh, state classes computed um, with the non-deterministic analysis, where every set of feasible behavior is here associated with a probability measure. Uh, in particular, a stochastic uh, fit class and codes uh, um, a marking, uh, a time joint domain, and the distribution of the active timers after um, a specific uh, sequence uh, of uh, transition firings. Global and local kernel are evaluated uh, um, using information encoded in the stochastic state classes, uh, which are not in this case enumerated strictly as done for non-deterministic analysis, but exploiting uh, uh, generations. And in particular, whatever is the starting state class, um, um, which is a, a regenerative state, the enumeration of successors is limited to the state uh, um, before a regeneration and then repeated for the regenerative states, simplifying the evaluation of the probability distribution of the of the of stochastic state classes. And this holds because in regenerative states, uh, the future does not depend on the past behavior anymore. Note that uh, when action two is applied, it may happen that some of the transitions are provided in numerical form. For instance, uh, after the application of action one uh, or action two itself. And uh, in these cases, uh, since uh, regenerative transient analysis requires to have transition expressed in an analytical form, we computed an analytical stochastic upper bound of the numerical CDF as a weighted sum of shifted and truncated exponential, whose parameters and supports are computed in order to guarantee stochastic ordering between the initial numerical distribution and the, and the computed analytical one. And uh, as this sketched um, in the figure on the left. Then we have action three, uh, which is applied to simplify um, inner blocks of uh, composite blocks that result to be too complex. And in this case, the inner blocks are evaluated with another action, and then they are uh, replaced with uh, single activity blocks uh, having the distribution computed during the inner block analysis. An example of inner block analysis is in the repetition block T, which is uh, in the figure replaced by the activity block T new. Action four is applied to complex tag blocks, and uh, in particular, um, we replicate the inner block um, 
and all its predecessors. And uh, uh, then the, the whole replicated block is uh, evaluated applying one of the other actions. Um, and then replaced by, uh, by an activity block. Since uh, um, we assume that uh, transition or inner block of the considered block are positively correlated, it is possible to show that uh, the computer response time is a safe bound for the real response time distribution. In the example, the replicated block is the one formed by TNU and its predecessors, which is then replaced by the activity block QRT new. Once actions are defined, we consider three different uh, heuristics that uh, combine them in different ways. And uh, in heuristic one, we apply numerical analysis to well-nested structures that don't contain uh, repeat or duck blocks. Uh, whenever they contain repeat or duck blocks, uh, action three is applied to, to the considered block uh, followed by action one. If the block is a repeat block, the regenerative transient analysis is applied only when the block is not uh, too complex. Otherwise, the inner block analysis is applied. Finally, if the block is a, is a duck block, we, we apply a regenerative uh, um, transient analysis if the block is simple enough. Otherwise, we iteratively apply the inner replication until the block is simple enough to be analyzed with some action. Heuristics two and three are obtained as variations of heuristic one, and in particular, heuristic uh, two um, changes the way DAG are handled uh, when they are too complex and performs uh, um, analysis of um, inner block instead of inner uh, replication. Heuristic three uh, use always regenerative transient analysis to evaluate uh, simple blocks. And this removes the numerical analysis from the method, changing the way well-structured blocks uh, without uh, repeat that blocks are handled. We experimented the three heuristics with the several models obtained by uh, the combination of uh, different uh, four substructures that uh, uh, arrange uh, inner blocks in different way and with different complexity. In particular, we consider simple DAG, which is the one uh, with a green label, whose analysis is feasible, a complex DAG, which is the one with a purple label, whose analysis is unfeasible and so it needs to be decomposed, um, a complex end uh, with, with the orange label that includes two instances of simple DAG, and finally, uh, the nested repetition uh, block, uh, which is the one with the violet label, includes an instance of, of, um, of complex end and uh, either an instance of simple deck or an instance of complex deck. From uh, these uh, substructures, we created four different models uh, uh, that we tested uh, in two variants. The variants differ in the fact uh, that one includes only instances of uh, simple DAG, uh, while the other includes only instances of uh, complex DAG. And this has been done uh, with the intent of uh, to assess uh, the scalability of the approach for models with increasing complexity. The models have been evaluated with the uh, presented heuristics and with a simulation that performs in times comparable to those of heuristic one. Uh, all results have been compared in terms of accuracy with a ground truth that have been obtained with a um, 500,000 run simulation. Accuracy has been evaluated using jensen shannon divergence, which is typically used to measure uh, the similarity between the probability distribution and which is uh, a symmetrical version of the kulbeck leibler divergence. Um, graphs uh, show that for all the tested models, heuristics uh, reach uh, better results than simulation, which is the orange one, which uh, appears to be very noisy. And uh, but this is due to the fact that simulation is constrained is constrained to run in times comparable to those of heuristic one. Between all the heuristics, the best results have been obtained by heuristic one and two. And this is supported also by the values obtained with the Jensen Shannon, and that are shown here in this table where uh, every row refers to a specific model, every column to a specific technique, uh, and the rows are ordered from the simplest to the most complex model. As it can be seen, 
the heuristic one is the heuristic that um, scores the best values in the majority of the cases, while heuristic two is the closest competitor since it scores sometimes the same value of heuristic one and other times better values than um, heuristic one. On the other hand, the simulation scores the worst result, except for model 3A and 3B, where heuristic three got the worst ones. Of course, for all, uh, all the used um, heuristics, as models increase in complexity, all Jensen Shannon values increase uh, too, because uh, complexity of models um, require a higher number of actions that may introduce uh, error in the accuracy, for instance, uh, uh, because of the approximation of numerical distribution in action two, or uh, also because of the inner block replication. However, we found, we found out that replicating dependent events, uh, um, as is done for complex uh, DAG blocks, uh, seems to be more accurate than analyzing submodels and reapproximating their CDF. And this is the reason why heuristic one outperforms the other method. Also, uh, for computation times, uh, heuristic one scores the best values since uh, it never exceeds uh, four seconds to provide results. Um, in contrast to heuristic two, which uh, uh, takes uh, uh, longer, despite it scores uh, a good Jensen Shannon value. Uh, as a limit case, uh, models uh, for A and for B show that heuristic two takes almost 30 times than heuristic one, and this suggests that heuristic one is preferable to heuristic two. Uh, moreover, heuristic one does not to be susceptible to model complexity. Simulation takes time comparable to those of heuristic one, but uh, as we have already seen, uh, provides uh, uh, worse results in terms of accuracy. And uh, moreover, simulation does not provide an over approximation of the CDF uh, as uh, all the other heuristics do. Uh, but this can be uh, an important feature for some context, uh, for example, in web service, quality of service evaluation, and this makes the approach uh, mm, the heuristics preferable to simulation in many contexts. In conclusion, um, in this paper, we propose a compositional approach that uh, exploits a hierarchical representation to um, evaluate the response time of uh, not well-nested workflows. Um, this representation enables the decomposition of uh, workflows in sub-blocks that can be then efficiently analyzed with different actions that uh, are differently arranged uh, uh, to form many heuristics. The actions are defined in such a way to guarantee that uh, computed results are stochastic upper bounds of CDF response time. And the experimentation shows uh, um, feasibility and scalability of the, of the approach that um, provides accurate results in very short times, especially for heuristic one. At the moment, we are evaluating how using uh, spline functions for uh, the analytical approximation of uh, numerical distribution affects the accuracy of results. And this could also bring to identify new um, analysis heuristics. Moreover, we would like to test the approach for different real application contexts, such as uh, microservice or supply chain management. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Ricardo and uh, thank you for your very clear presentation. So um, are there question, questions? So is there someone who wants uh, to ask a question? So I start with uh, some uh, consideration. So I think that uh, it is very interesting uh, this approach of your work because uh, you study compositional methods uh, in the context of performance evaluation. Uh, and uh, in particular, you consider uh, uh, complex uh, stochastic workflows. Uh, and uh, um, I noticed that the workflows are specified in terms of stochastic Petri nets. So my question is, uh, um, can your approach uh, be generalized uh, to classes of stochastic Petri nets? Uh, or um, since uh, any stochastic Petri nets uh, has an underlying queuing network, uh, can you identify some class uh, of uh, networks uh, or queuing networks uh, to which uh, your method can be applied? 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I think that um, one of the main contribution of the paper is that uh, we provided uh, um, a graphical formalism, which is uh, connected, uh, which is mm, with um, uh, um, enables to represent uh, workflows uh, um, using um, uh, a BNF grammar. And uh, so I think that uh, if you want to represent something like uh, a queue um, for how is um, the grammar now, um, probably you just can use uh, sequences of, uh, of uh, activities. But uh, I, now that I'm listening to my answer, I think that uh, um, sequence of activities is too simple. So probably I misunderstood the question. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, if I can help uh, Ricardo, because uh, the, the question is quite deep. Uh, so a, a contribution there is that uh, the model is organized uh, in a hierarchical structure yes. where you have a single entry and single exit in the end. And uh, as for now, uh, each block uh, is uh, either a well-nested composition of elementary uh, Petri net transitions, uh, or it is a DAG, uh, directed acyclic graphs, uh, which serves to represent uh, not well-nested compositions. Well, in this scheme, your suggestion is, uh, is interesting. So, I mean, uh, we might have uh, within a block the traversal time that you have uh, within a queue uh, modeled uh, in, in any way and perhaps a subject uh, to, to various kinds of delays that uh, are not necessarily modeled in this structure. And uh, this would change uh, uh, the, um, uh, so the syntax for the representation of the model, but not uh, the, the essence uh, of, uh, of the analysis of the composition approach. Thank you. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. Because uh, I think that uh, it is very interesting in your, uh, your approach and your work, uh, because uh, it is difficult uh, to find uh, so rigorous uh, compositional methods uh, in uh, the context of performance evaluation. And we know that uh, there are results on uh, product forms, uh, but uh, they are sometimes very difficult to, to apply, especially for complex systems uh, like the, the workflows that you define and you study here. So uh, the idea could be try to generalize uh, your work uh, uh, in order maybe to obtain uh, novel results uh, also in the, in the context of uh, Petri nets or queuing networks. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank I don't you. see other questions. Uh, so I think that we can move to the next speaker. So the next uh, uh, paper is entitled Transient Analysis of Hierarchical Semi-Markov Process Models with the Tool Support in State Flow. And the speaker is Stefan, Stefan Kalen, and the authors are Stefan Kalen, Matthias Nieberg, and Ol Matson. So thank you, Stefan, for your presentation. We can uh, go with the presentation. Hello. Today I'm going to talk to you about our paper, Transient Analysis of Hierarchical semi Markov Process Models with Tool Support in Stateful. And this is a paper I wrote together with uh, Matthias Nieberg and Ole Matson, and my name is Stefan Kolan. And this was uh, part of a joint project between uh, uh, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, and Scania Track Development. And uh, when we say transient analysis, what we're actually are looking at is to utilize this in part of a safety analysis of uh, safety critical systems, but the method can of course be used also for other systems and for other purposes. So, uh, stochastic processes today has no widespread in industrial safety analysis. Uh, but at Scania we have uh, in the later years seen an increase in complexity in systems, especially with the development of autonomous vehicles. 
and in these cases, the classical uh, safety analysis tools such as fault trees and FMEOS are no longer a solution. So we need new methods, uh, and which is why we propose using stochastic processes. But the modeling needs to be close to what's used in industry today. And that's why we suggest using state transition diagrams, which are well spread in, in the industry. Uh, and we also need tools that are close to what's used in industry today in order to help in the transition of the industry to using these new me methods. And that's why we have presented the SMP tool, which is based on the model specified in Stateflow. So let's talk a bit about Siemens Markov processes and state transition diagrams. So take a look at the figure we have on the right here. So we have four possible states here, S1, S2, S3, and S4. And we have several possible transitions between the states. So this is basically a state transition diagram. You have a couple of states and you have some transitions between them. Uh, now underlying this model is a semi Markov process. So wh when we enter a state, for example, S3, uh, each of the, for each of the transitions with S3 as a region, this is these two transitions, the timer starts counting down. Uh, and the time from which each of these timers starts counting down is given by the corresponding probability distribution. So uh, here we have an uh, exponential distribution with rate 2, and here we have a uniform distribution between 0 0.5 and 1.5. So uh, these timers, uh, one for each of these transitions, will start competing against each other once we enter S3. And the one that reaches 0 L first will cause the corresponding transition. Uh, now, in the case of a Markov process, all these timers need to have a, a exponential distribution. So in this case, when we have several uniform distribution, we are no longer in the Markov process, but in what we call a semi Markov process. Well, what is called a semi Markov process? Uh, and we also allow for some junctions here. So once this transition occurs, when we're in S1, we can have several possible target states of that transition. Uh, S3 with probability uh, 0 0.95 and S2 with probability 0 0.05. Now, what we can see in practice is that these S&P models actually is not enough to model complex real world systems in, in uh, most cases, or in many cases at least. So what we then have to do is to look at more general uh, models. And this is what we have done in this paper. We have looked at what we call the hierarchical SMP model. So it's quite similar to the SMP model, but we have some hierarchy in it. So when state S21 is entered, uh, one timer starts counting down uh, for this transition, and this timer will take exactly one hour and one timer starts counting down for this transition and this will be uniformly distributed between half an hour and one and a half hour. Now, if this transition occurs first, uh, then we will remember at what time that happened for this timer and that's how much time is left on that timer. And how much time is left on that timer will now compete with this new uh, timer. So. Uh, the difference from the semi Markov process is that we can have transitions here that for which we do not forget at which time they were once a transition inside the hierarchy occurs. And the, these models correspond to a subset of the Stowe charts presented by Janssen. So now we are going to look at how do we actually solve these SP models. And when we say solve, we mean uh, compute the reliability or the, or the probability of ending up in a down state. So we say that S1 is our initial state. We always start in that one. And we say that S3 
corresponds to a system failure. So we want to calculate the probability that we have reached S3 in a certain time or the reliability, which is simply the probability that we have not reached S3 at a certain point in time. So, and we present an algor algorithm for doing this. So in the easiest case, all transitions with S2 as origin, which is only this one, uh, have exponential distributions. Uh, in that case, it is quite simple to just move these transitions so that they have, uh, uh, so we need to duplicate this transition and put one of them with S21 as a region and one of them with S22 as a region. And then we can remove this S2 and are left with S1, S21 and S22 and S3. So that's the simplest case of solving it. Uh, but in most cases, uh, we will not be able to do that because we will, as we see here, have a non-exponential distribution out of S2. Now, in this case, what we do instead is that we want to transform uh, the model so to a model where all transitions with a transition inside S with a state inside S2 as uh, origin and all transitions with a state inside S2 as target, uh, while the, the target in this case and region in this case is outside of S2. So basically all transitions with move over this line of S2. Uh, we want to transform them so that this one has S2 as region and this one has S2 as target. In this case, there will be no way to reach S21 and S22, and we can simply remove these states and, and the transitions between them. And what we're left is what we're left with is a semen marker process, which we can then, in the last steps of our algorithm, uh, solve with uh, as semen marker processes are usually solved. And uh, it should be mentioned that. In both the paper and in these presentations, we have assumed that all uh, timers have exponential dis ex exponential distributions. And exponential is a class which contains, for example, uniform and exponential distributions. So how this works out in practice. So this is what I said. We want to transform this model into a semi marker process where we have gotten rid of these inner states. Uh, and for this transition into S21, it's quite simple. We just change the target to S2. But for uh, this transition out of S22, it's a bit harder because the transition we end up with depends on both this and this transition. So we need to find this out. And we do this by looking at what we call the inner semi marker process. So that's the semi marker process consisting of uh, all states within S2, all states between, all transitions between them, which is only this one, and all uh, transitions uh, with uh, all transitions with an origin in S2 and uh, uh, destination outside of S2. So this is what we end up with. And by solving this as a usual uh, semi marker process, we can then find this, find out this, uh, this distribution uh, symbolically. Now, uh, the tougher case is what we can see here. So the left uh, figure is what we had before, and the right is what we call a uh, model with unbounded generation. So in this case, we can take an infinite number of transitions uh, between inside of S2 before it is left. In this case, we can only take one inside of S2 before it's left. Uh, so in this case, when we can uh, take an infinite number while we're in S2, an infinite number of transitions, uh, we still want to do the same thing. We want to transform this HSP model into a, an SMP model 
but finding this distribution is a much harder task. So what we do is that we look at the Laplace Tiltius transform of this of this uh, probability distribution instead. And that one we can find symbolically by then taking random draws of it, uh, by then using it to get random draws of this uh, probability distribution, we can finally find the uh, the, the Laplace Tilti transform of the probability of reaching S3 after some time. And by taking a numerical inverse Laplace transform out of that, we can, for some points in time, find the probability of reaching S3. So, uh, so here we have a small validation of our uh, method. So we have a simple HSP model here. And uh, for some of the transitions, there are here uh, uh, variables. And we allow these variables to take some different values. Uh, we then want to look at each combination of these parameters. So we end up with a total of 81 models. And uh, what we then did was that we, for each of these models, uh, found the probability of reaching the downstate S3 uh, after 45,000 hours. Uh, by using our method, which is this fnum result, and by using a Monte Carlo simulation, which is fsim result, and compare the results. So by looking at the relative error, we can in this histogram see that most of the models actually had uh, uh, close to no error at all. Uh, and for even the worst one of all the models, the error was still uh, below one and since when doing safety analysis you are more interested in the magnitude of the probability of reaching the down state and not the uh, exact value for each of the models uh, we actually got uh, an an acceptable result from our method so we will now present our tool which is the smp tool uh, which implements our method and it's available at the website you see there. Uh, it's a MATLAB application which is based on stateful models uh, and MATLAB is a language and environment for technical computing while Stateflow is a tool for modeling state machines which is within the MATLAB product family. And uh, MATLAB has been chosen since it's very common in industry especially the automotive industry and uh, it has more than 5 million users worldwide. So we will now demo the tool by looking at a simple, or by looking at a case study uh, concerning an electric, a battery electric vehicle or battery electric truck. And we will, uh, and here we have the model. So we want to find out what's the probability of the battery uh, getting caught on fire or venting harmful gas um, in the electric vehicle. And this caused by a fluid leakage in the, in the battery itself, or one of the batteries. So we have this first state where everything works fine. Uh, we can get a fluid leakage here inside the battery. Uh, and uh, after some time, this is diagnosed and we have some probability that it will be missed. Uh, but if before the diagnosis or after the diagnosis, but the fault has the fault has been missed, uh, we will eventually reach a short circuit. Now, in the case when the safety mechanism is in place, uh, this is no problem. So we will. The safety mechanism is what's known as parafuse. It's basically a small explosive short charge in the circuit of the battery and it will uh, go off and uh, simply cut off the circuit before the short circuit can lead to venting or fire in the battery. Now the tricky case is when uh, we are in S3 here when the safety mechanism has been disabled. 
so if we are in S1 when this happens, for example, uh, we go to X, S6, battery find, which can lead to a fluid leakage and a short circuit. But in this case, the short circuit will lead to a fire or venting in battery because the pyrofuse or safety mechanism is disabled. So we will now uh, analyze this model to find what's the probability of if we start in S1 ending up in S5 after some point in time. So uh, this is our tool and we want to calculate this probability for some different times up to 45,000 hours which is what you usually develop tracks for to uh, in the safety analysis. So we run our uh, analysis here. Uh, it goes a bit quicker here because I've done it before uh, but it is in uh, it is in seconds of magnitude it takes to run this. Uh, and here we can see how the probability of reaching the down state changes with time. And uh, you can also see here that if we look at the lifetime, which is the most interesting part, you can see that the probability of reaching the down state, that is getting a fire venting in a battery, is 1 to the power of minus 6. Uh, so that was uh, just a small uh, a small demo of the tool. There are more features and uh, feel free to look it up. It is free to download for everyone. Uh, so, and we also compare this tool with the ORIS tool, which is another tool we can handle complex models. Uh, difference is that it looks at models uh, modeled with uh, stochastic extensions of Petronets, while we look at st state transition diagrams with stochastic extensions. Um, and we first did this on the case study I just showed you, and we found that uh, both the precision of the result and the time it took to analyze were comparable in both cases. Uh, but we also tried with a different model here, uh, which is basically our, our example model we showed I showed earlier, this presentation, which I had 81 variants of. And this is uh, a certain choice of parameters for it then. And in this case, the number of transition expected here in S2 is very high. And in this case, this affects the this, this affects how well the URIS tool works a lot. So after 12 hours, it had still not found a result. While our method does not depend on it, so our tool could find the value after just a few seconds. So this shows that there are situations where our tool and our method are quite more effective than existing tools and methods. So conclusions and future work. Uh, stochastic processes are still uncommon in industrial safety work today. Uh, and uh, that's why we have proposed SMP models based on state transition diagrams, uh, since state transition diagrams are already common in industry. Uh, we have proposed a combined symbolic numerical approach to solve these models and we have proposed SMP tool to help in the transition to a stochastic process approach in industry. Now in the future work we will look at generalizing this approach towards parallel SMPs um, and the underlying stochastic process is, that, is then what's known as a generalized SEMA marker process. Uh, and we will do this with implementation into the SMP tool. So thanks for listening and are there any questions? Well, thank you, Stefan, for your presentation. So are there any questions? I would like to ask a question. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I um, uh, would like to uh, you to discuss a bit more about uh, the complexity of the approach uh, with respect to the number of concurrent activities that uh, there can be in each state and also uh, with respect to um, the number of uh, nested states, so the number of levels in your uh, hierarchical model. Thanks. Yeah, right. Uh, so the number of concurrent activities, 
Well, that of course depends on the nesting of the state as well. But if we look beside that, I guess that depends on the number of transitions you have uh, active at the same time. And uh, of course, the number of active transitions is what what the uh, solution is most dependent on. Uh, the actual number of states is what really matters is what, how much is concurrent, as you say. And uh, it can in uh, in difficult instances, if you want to have largely greater systems, it can uh, become an issue. Uh, but we have found in our uh, in all our case studies, we have applied it to then our the number of concurrent transitions and the number of uh, states has been in such a size that it has been in yeah under a minute to uh, analyze them. Uh, of course, there are some uh, parameters you can set in the tool, which will also affect the uh, time it will take, uh, but will also affect the. Uh, uh, the accuracy of the results. Uh, for diff several levels of the tool, it also handles it uh, in, it depends on how the levels look. If there are uh, uh, like only exponentials in the inner levels, but I should say in each case, the, it is, the sensitivity is depending on the, Number of concurrent uh, number of concurrent transitions uh, in general, mostly. So that depends on how many transitions you would have in each uh, state. I would say. Thanks for your question. Okay, thank you, Stefan. So Thanks. I think that that we do not have uh, many time for uh, uh, other questions. Uh, so I propose to move to the next uh, paper and the next uh, presentation. Thank you, Stefan. So, Thank you for listening. So the next uh, uh, work is entitled uh, Evaluating the Effectiveness of uh, Meta Models in Emulating uh, Quantitative Models. And uh, the authors are Michael Rush and William Sanders. And the speaker is Michael Rush. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk today on evaluating the effectiveness of metamodeling in emulating quantitative models. My name is Michael Rausch. I'm from the University of Illinois, and I did this work in collaboration with my advisor, Bill Sanders, who is at CMU. So the motivation for our problem, many quantitative models have many inputs whose values are uncertain because the world we live in is, is uncertain. And most models are trying to forecast things about the future and the future is uncertain. Sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification are te techniques or approaches that people use to help explore and manage uncertainty in model inputs. However, sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification traditionally require running the model many times and many models, many realistic models of complex systems often have long run times. So it's often infeasible to do traditional sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification on these sorts of models. One approach to dealing with the problem of sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification taking too long using traditional approaches is to use meta models. Meta models can be a stand in for the base model that allows a much faster sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification. So we review the definition and description of a meta model. A meta model is a model which is designed to emulate the behavior of another model, which throughout the rest of the presentation we will call the base model. So given the same input, the meta model tries to produce an output that is as close to the output that the base model would have produced had it been given the same input. Usually the meta model isn't um, able to perfectly emulate the base model. So what you're in effect doing is trading some accuracy for much faster run times. And the key idea is to build the meta model and then apply the sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification 
directly to or to the meta model instead of the base model. So the meta model, uh, you're doing a sort of indirect sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification. In prior work, we tested the meta model approach on two different test cases, a botnet growth model and an advanced metering infrastructure model. We found that meta models that were designed to emulate these base models are reasonably accurate, run hundreds or thousands of times faster than the original model, and that sensitivity analysis applied to the meta model largely agrees with the sensitivity analysis applied to the base model. So these are very encouraging results that we got in the past. We published the test case one in KEST last year and the AMI test case we published last year at SmartGridCom. But we wanted to collect further evidence that this approach generalizes. We wanted to try more test cases. To that end, we tested six additional PRISM test cases. I believe that many people in the audience will be familiar with PRISM, but PRISM briefly is a modeling formalism and tool. And luckily, many people have made models in PRISM and uh, allow the, the many of these uh, models are on PRISM's website and publicly available. So we uh, went through a, all of the PRISM models and we selected non-trivial models that had many inputs. On average, the models we selected had 12 inputs, um, which we could use, which would be good candidates as test cases for our meta-modeling approach. In particular, we are interested in the accuracy and the speed of these meta-models, of the meta-models built to emulate these base models. It's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into detail about the different PRISM models we selected, but here's a, a brief overview that shows um, which domains they came from. We had reliability and availability um, models. We had manufacturing models, a couple of chemistry models, a biology model. So that's pulled from many different domains, which helps us to see whether this generalizes, um, but all of the models had in common that they were non-trivial and they had a relatively large number of uncertain input variables. So we're going to briefly review the meta-modeling approach that we developed, that we uh, showed at KEST last year. We also made some improvements to the architecture since then, and we will, once we have completed this review of how the architecture works, we will go over the enhancements we made since then. The first step of this machine learning based meta modeling approach is to collect the training and testing data. To do this, you generate a bunch of random inputs and you run them through the base model and record the resulting corresponding outputs. The training data and test data is kept separate. Once you've collected the necessary training data and test data, you can construct the meta model using machine learning. How should one do this? So there are a bunch of different uh, machine learning techniques. So for example, there are random forests, stochastic gradient descent, multi-layer perceptrons, gradient boosting machines, and on and on. There are just a plethora of different regressor types out there. And it can be overwhelming and to know which one of these you should choose from. So traditionally, what's been done in the literature in the past is you try several different kinds of regressors and you use the test data to evaluate the accuracy of each regressor and you choose the best performing one to use as your meta model. This is known as, we term this the best of many approach. But if you've gone through the trouble of training several different regressors, you might ask yourself if there's some way to combine the predictions, combine the regressors, and have them work together so that used in combination, they might be stronger than the best by itself. One way to do this is to find the average prediction of all of the regressors. This could work, but in practice, very often some of the 
most poorly performing regressors are is going to drag the overall prediction quality down. So what you'd really like to do is find some way to weight the regressor predictions so that the best performing regressors have more of a contribution to the final uh, meta model output compared to the others. Like so. But how should one do the weighting? That seems like a complicated problem in itself. How much more should you weight the well-performing regressors compared to the poorly performing, performing regressors? That sounds like something that can be learned using machine learning. So, and in fact, you can. So the stacking approach trains another set of regressors using enhanced training data. So the predictions from the first level of regressors are appended to the training data, and that enhanced training data is used to train a new set of regressors that have more information than the original set because they have the information of all of the predictions made by the previous regressors. These enhanced regressors are in a sen sense uh, weighting the prediction values of the, the predictions of the previous regressors to help inform their own decision. So these regressors, you can choose the best performing of the second set of regressors and use that as the final meta model prediction. So this kind of ensemble technique is called stacking. In practice, we find that it's helpful to have a filter that filters out the outliers, the, the most poorly performing regressors, but so that they don't forward their predictions onto the next level. So all of this is a review of work done uh, and presented last year at KEST. And now we shall show some of the enhancements we made to the architecture since then. Our two contributions are in evaluating different kinds of filters and evaluating different kinds of committees and uh, committee composition at each level. So we're first going to look at the filters. We evaluated two kinds of filters. This is the, uh, the, the two filters that we tried are the error within 10% of best regressor filter. So it filters all the regressors that have an error that's greater than 10% of the best regressor. And we tried that for different threshold values, 10%, 20%, 50%, and 100%. We also tried a filter that filters out all of the regressors except for the top K performing regressors. So top one, top two, top three. And we also tried this with no filter at all, just as a control. We rank them by accuracy so that, and we find that the error within 10% of best regressor filter is the most accurate. And the class of filters that is in general most accurate is the error within n% percent of best regressor filter. And we find that the top K um, filter types are don't perform well and in fact perform worse than having no filter at all. So we recommend in the future that people use the error within 10% of best regressor filter in their own stacked meta model architectures. Next, we look at different committees. So there are two different, uh, the, one might ask themselves, what is the best committee composition? What kind of regressors should go into each committee? Should you have just a few regressors? Should you have many, many regressors? What kinds of regressors should you have, uh, et cetera? So we evaluated um, several different committees. We evaluated the meta models accuracy given different kinds of committees. Our hypothesis was that committees that are large and heterogeneous will outperform those committees that are smaller and more homogeneous, although we believe that at some point the, there'll be a point of diminishing returns in both the size and the heterogeneity of the committee. We largely confirmed our hypothesis. So these are the five committees we tried. They differ in the number of regressors and whether they, the kinds of regressors that they have 
in each committee. So the committees are here ranked by accuracy from most accurate to least accurate. The best performing committee had one random forest regressor in it, eight multi-layer perceptrons that differed in their hyperparameters, four gradient boosting regressors that varied in their hyperparameters, one ridge CV regressor, 10k nearest neighbor regressors, one Gaussian process regressor, and one stochastic gradient descent regressor. And all of the others were smaller, and some were had just one kind of um, regressor in it. So for example, the third committee here listed has just different kinds of random forest regressors in it that differ in the hyperparameters used. So we recommend based on these results that a um, modeler in the future should use a committee that has a large number of regressors and as much heterogeneity as possible. So in conclusion, the two new contributions we made to the architecture since last year's uh, presented work on this stacking architecture was an evaluation of different kinds of filters and different kinds of committees and recommendations about which committees and filters most increase the accuracy of the meta model. We now go back to evaluating each of the six test cases now that we have the fully formed meta model. We will evaluate it on both accuracy and speed. So the accuracy of the meta model is given here. So we try three different kinds of meta models for each of the test cases. A naive meta model, the best of many meta model, and the stacked meta model, which we developed. The naive meta model is just as a control. The naive meta model works by finding the average output in the test or in the training data set and using that as the prediction for every one of the inputs in the test data set. So since it's giving the same prediction, output prediction for each of the inputs, any reasonably um, performant meta model should be able to outperform the naive meta model. And we do find here that the best of many meta model does outperform the naive meta model substantially, which is great. But even better, we find that the stacked meta model that we developed is always at least as good as the best of many meta model and often substantially better. So these are really encouraging results, accuracy numbers. We also evaluated the accuracy for our stacked approach given different training data set sizes. Obviously, you want to have as many training samples as reasonably possible in order to get the most accurate meta model, but the base model takes so long to run that you often can't um, collect as much training data as you'd like. So it's important to know how accurate things are, how accurate the meta model approach is given very limited training data set sizes. So here we show the accuracy numbers for different training data set sizes, and we see that, as expected, more training data leads to more accurate meta models. But uh, we do see that even with a very limited amount of training data, we can still get reasonably accurate meta models. Finally, here are the speed numbers for the both the base model, the meta model, and the training time for the meta model. So the base model and meta model were both executed with the same test set of 200 randomly generated inputs. And we see that in every case, the meta model was thousands to tens of thousands of times faster than the base model. This enables um, sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification techniques that would be too slow to do if you applied directly to the base model, but can feasibly be accomplished if applied to the meta model. We also see that the meta model only takes a couple of minutes to train on average. So these speed numbers are also very encouraging. In conclusion, we were able to create meta models that were 
thousands of times faster than the base model, significantly more accurate than the former state of practice meta models that were used in uh, related work and able to facilitate sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification. We evaluated different kinds of filters and different kinds of committees on their accuracy and make recommendations about what kinds of filters and committees people should use for their stacked meta models in the future. And we collected evidence that the stacking approach generalizes well by applying it to six new uh, previously published PRISM models. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention during it. If you have any questions, I'll be available after this video presentation. And if you're seeing this uh, offline, you can contact me, send me any questions you might have to my email address here. Thank you again. Sabina, uh, you're you're muted. muted. Sorry, sorry. So thank you, Michael, for your presentation. So is there anyone uh, who wants to ask a question? So I have uh, a question. So you propose uh, um, the use of meta models for uh, a particular kind of analysis, in particular uh, sensitivity analysis or uh, uncertainty quantification. So I wonder whether your approach can be extended to other type of performance analysis. Have you think about this? Well, we, we have thought about it um, a bit. We think it could also be useful for certain kinds of optimization problems um, where you're trying to search a, a large search space. Um, but we've mostly focused so far on the applications of sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification. Wow, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. And I, I have another question. Oh, I see a question in the chat. So uh, this is an anonymous attendee. I don't know who is uh, asking the question. Uh, do you know why some uh, homogeneous regressors uh, work worse than other homogeneous ones? I, I don't know for sure because these are, are sort of black box models. No, it's hard to know exactly why the machine learning approaches are, are making the decisions that they are making. That's one of the difficulties with a more data-driven approach like um, what we took here. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so I think that uh, we can uh, stop here. And uh, uh, I know that uh, Enrico Vicario has uh, some announcement. So I think that Enrico, you can uh, take uh, the word. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Uh, I'm just... Uh announcing uh, uh, as uh, chair of the steering committee that uh, this year, as uh, every year, we have uh, a ballot for the election of two members of the steering committee. Uh, and uh, to this end, I will send uh, an email uh, to all the uh, attendants uh, of Confed of CONFEST uh, who registered uh, uh, marking their interest uh, for CAST, which uh, should be about uh, 200 people. I hope that everything will run properly with the mailing. And uh, the ballot will take place uh, as in the past year uh, using this tool that we use at, at that time, a doodle is called, this will be specified in the mail. Uh, I, in particular, uh, this is the occasion to <laughs> correct uh, the flow we had uh, the past year uh, in the timing uh, of, uh, of the uh, ballot uh, that was really unfair for people uh, in the US in particular, or uh, more generally all over uh, uh, America. And uh, so candidates can uh, send, uh, can step ahead uh, by sending uh, an email to myself. This will be written uh, in the mail that you are going to receive soon. Uh, and uh, uh, this can be done until uh, tomorrow, 
at uh, 5 p.m. in the time uh, of the conference, uh, which is uh, Central Europe uh, summer time. Um, and uh, I will uh, set up the ballot at that time, uh, immediately after having uh, uh, received uh, the candidatures by uh, people who are interested in taking part. And, uh, and then uh, the ballot will be open uh, until uh, August 26, which is the last day of the conference uh, at uh, 6 p.m., which is uh, 30 minutes before the end of the conference, uh, so that tentatively I will be able to communicate the result. But the uh, A-Doodle tool is made in such a way that uh, each one taking part uh, in the process has the same visibility on the process uh, as uh, myself who will set up. So anyone will be able to see immediately. Uh, Informally, uh, I can tell you that uh, as far as now, uh, uh, the, 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 there were a, a, a pair of, uh, of uh, possible candidates uh, who are uh, Jos Peter Catun and uh, Giuliano Casale, and uh, anyone else uh, can take part uh, in, the, in the process anyway. Okay, uh, I hope everything will run fine uh, because there are uh, a few technical steps in particular in sending out uh, 200 mails uh, using my mailer. I hope everything is fine. The past year we had some difficulty on this and I hope to be on time uh, as uh, I will tell you. Uh, grazie, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you Enrico. Space. Thank you Enrico. So I think that we can stop here and uh, remember that there is a, a keynote at uh, 6.30. Okay, thank you and goodbye. Ciao. 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 Okay.